Stand with the King of Kings and has faith. 
caught me up out from the room. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. What was was dead is now alone. You gave to me the breath of life. You brought me up out from the room. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. You, my God, you, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved off this I'm sure. You're my God, and you saved my soul. You, my God, you, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forever. More. I want to be moved off the sun. You're my God and you say my soul. This piece is with everyone. Uh, how wonderful is it to know uh, that all of us will be standing next to the King of Kings one day and we will be in His presence. I think before we start with the sermon this morning i would also just would like to say from myself and marinda happy solal i hope i pronounced it correctly yeah. uh, happy lunar new year to all of you may it be a blessed time uh, and may you enjoy so let's get into today's service i uh, also apologize there will be no uh, PowerPoint presentation this morning, so if you have your Bible with you, you can just follow along. Uh, we will be looking at Mark 1, verses 1 to 8 today. And this is all about the preparation of Jesus' ministry. And we will see today what this entails um, for us and what this meant to the people living in the star and you can read with me we'll start in mark 1 verse 1 at the beginning of the gospel of jesus christ the son of god as it is written in isaiah the prophet behold i send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare the way of the lord make his path straight john appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins and all of judea uh, sorry and all of the country of judea and all jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather, a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So we see here we are in the Gospel of Mark. The writer writing here is Mark himself. Mark was a very close companion of the Apostle Peter. So this is where Mark received uh, his gospel he received it from peter so peter was an eyewitness of the life of jesus and peter told mark everything and mark recorded this mark was not a follower or a disciple of jesus himself but he would he was traveling with peter many scholars argue and say that uh, mark wrote down the memoirs of peter and this is why we have the gospel of mark Today, Mark is also known as John Mark in the book of Acts. And he is the one that um, went with Barnabas on and Paul 
on their first missionary trip and he also abandoned them on this first missionary trip. But as we know in the book of Acts and in the letters of Paul, he redeemed himself uh, after a few years and him and Paul, they were reconciled with each other once again. And Mark is a cousin of Barnabas. So we see Mark is the one writing to us here in the Gospel of Mark. We have seen the name John. So this is not John the disciple, but this is John the Baptist. So we'll be looking at John the Baptist today. So firstly, we need to go and see, but who is John the Baptist? And where did he come from? Uh, I mean, we've just read in verse 6, he was clothed with camel hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. So it seems that that was his diet, this was his food. And judging from his appearance, wearing a camel, camel hair and a leather belt, he looks kind of wild. If you, if you can imagine this guy in front of you, eating wild honey, eating locusts, having a leather belt and camel hair. He doesn't look like the ordinary person of that time. He looks a little bit different, maybe a little bit weird from, from what we have here. So we need to go and look at who is John. And we find this in Luke 1 verse 13. He was the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to their Lord, their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient of the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So here we see that the angel of the Lord appeared to Elizabeth and Zechariah as well before Mary uh, was pregnant with Jesus. John, Elizabeth was pregnant with John the Baptist. And we also see that he was filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb already. We have another evidence of, of John the Baptist in Luke 1 verses 76. And it says, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare His ways, to give knowledge of salvation to His people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So we see in the book of Luke that this prophet will be a prophet of the Most High. And we've seen when we did the introduction of the Gospels that Jesus would, was called in the book of Luke, Son of the Most High. So here we see that John the Baptist will be a prophet of the Most High. Now, John's name back in the first century was a very common name. So there were a lot of people, guys who named, whose name was John. And John basically means the Lord is gracious. So this is what John's name meant. And John was a relative of Jesus Christ. He was family of Jesus, John the Baptist. And he baptized people for repentance of their sins in the wilderness. This was John's ministry. And John was beheaded by Herod 
Antipas in the Gospels. Uh, we'll get there on a later of time. But the angel of the God, the Lord, also said that he will go in the same power as Elijah. So as we go along, try to remember uh, this verse, that he will go in the same power as Elijah. So it's very interesting of this account of the birth of John the Baptist is the following, that he wasn't allowed to drink strong drink or, or wine. And we find evidence of this in Numbers 6 verses 2 to 13. So John the Baptist was a Nazirite, uh, a lifelong Nazirite. And this is what it meant uh, for you to be a uh, Nazirite, uh, and it says the following Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When either a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazirite, to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar made from wine or strong drink. And he shall not drink any juice of grapes or eat grapes. So John wasn't even allowed to eat normal grapes. Fresh or dry, all the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine. Not even the seeds or the skins. All the days of his vow of separation, no razor shall touch his head until the time is completed for which he separates himself to the Lord. He shall be holy, he shall let the locks of his hair, of his head, grow long. We also see all the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body, not even for his father or for his mother, brother or sister. If they die, he shall make himself unclean, because his separation to God is on his head. All the days of his separation is to be holy to the Lord. So we see John the Baptist, he was a lifelong Nazareth. So there is other two people in the Bible that followed in the same footsteps, and one of them was Samson. You remember the account of Samson? Uh, they were not allowed to cut his hair and the prophet Samuel. So they were lifelong Nazirites. So now we need to remember now, so John is wearing camel's hair, he's wearing a leather belt, he's eating wild honey and locusts, and the razor has never touched his hair. Imagine how long his hair was. This is why I'm saying this appearance of John it's, it's something I, I think was very strange to the first century world to see this man coming out of the wilderness. He's got long hair, maybe he had a long beard. He's eating locusts, he's eating honey. I think it looked very strange to the people of that time. I also mean in Luke 3, we see that it's not any person that lives in the desert. The deserts are really cold at night and very hot. During a day, and here comes this man out of the desert proclaiming a message of repentance. So, just by looking at the description of John, it's clear to me that he looked like a wild man. He looked like a wild man seeing this guy in front of you. Jesus himself said that there will be no one greater than John the Baptist. We find this in Matthew. 11 verse 11 and why is the ministry of John important it's important for the following reasons John and Jesus's ministry was the same ministry we should remember that they were not in competition with each other they worked together with the same goal in mind we've just read the scriptures that John will prepare the way for the Lord Jesus. He will be the one to prepare the people for the coming 
Messiah. So we should always remember that they were working on the same side. They were working towards the same goal. John was the forerunner for Jesus' ministry, meaning that he went out to prepare the people for the message that Jesus would bring. This was John's mission. He was the one to go and tell the nation of Israel, but there's someone coming after me whose sandals are not worthy to even untie. So this was John's mission. He went out preaching so that the people will know that the kingdom of God has arrived in the world through Jesus Christ. John needed to prepare the people of the coming Messiah. And we should remember now, when we look at the last book in the Old Testament, um, it's Malachi, just before Matthew. So for 400 years, God was silent. Between 400 and 430 years, God didn't speak to the nation of Israel. The last time He spoke to them was in Malachi 4. And now here, He's speaking to them in Matthew. So for 400 years, God remained silent. There was no prophecy regarding the nation of Israel. The last time they received prophecy was in Malachi. And we find this in Malachi 4. Verse 4, and it says the following. Remember the law of my servant, the statutes and the rules that are commanded him at a horror for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a degree of utter destruction. So this we find in Malachi 4 verse 4. This is the last time God spoke to the nation of Israel before the birth of the Lord Jesus. So for 400 years, God was silent. But here we see, we find in verse 5 that in Malachi it says that, Behold, I will send you Elijah. So now we have Elijah and we have John. We see here in the first verse that we've read today, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. So can we uh, maybe confuse John and Elijah with each other? I think it's a possibility that we can confuse them. But is John Elijah? Was John exactly like Elijah. No, Elijah was not John, but they operated in the same office, in the same power. This is why many in Israel believe that Elijah would come back, because we should remember Elijah never died, because God took him up in heaven with a chariot of fire. He never died a natural death like all of us would die. There's only two people in, in the Bible that never died. It was uh, Enoch in, in Genesis, and it was Elijah. They never tasted physical death like all of us will taste that one day. So, the nation of Israel knew Elijah never died. He was taken up to heaven by a chariot of fire. And now here in Malachi we see, but behold, I will send Elijah. So the nation of Israel, some of the people got a little bit confused. They were expecting the same Elijah to, to come back. But Elijah wasn't John. But they operated in the same power. They had the same ministry or authority given by God to operate. So it's also important to remember that Jesus said in Matthew 11 verse 14 that John was the Elijah to come. So Jesus was also saying they will move in the same power but they are not physically the same. They are not the same person. So, and we should also remember 
like I just said, like the Jews were aware that Elijah had not died. And we find this in 2 Kings 2 verses 11. They operated in the same power, in the same spirit. That is why many confused uh, the scriptures and thought that Elijah, the same Elijah that lived a few hundred years before, would come back in the new, but it wasn't the case. They only operated in the same power. So Jesus was actually saying that the Old Testament prophecy, prophecy of Malachi would be fulfilled in John the Baptist's uh, ministry. So the verse we just read, Malachi 4 verse 4 verse 5, that this would be fulfilled when John arrives on the scene. The prophecy would come true. We should also remember that John was an Old Testament prophet. His ministry is recorded in the New Testament, but his activity took place in the Old Testament. So John is the last prophet of the Old Testament. So we only have the recordings of John the Baptist in the New Testament. So he was also an Old Testament prophet. And we find this in Matthew 11 verse 13. Jesus said uh, the following. Uh, Jesus said that all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. So John was the last uh, prophet of the Old Testament. So John is basically he's bringing the gap from the Old Testament to the New Testament. He is the bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So this is just a little bit of a background of who John the Baptist was. And I believe it's important for us to understand that Jesus and John worked together. They never worked against each other. We will see later on in the Gospels that the disciples were telling uh, John the Baptist, but uh, go look there over the Jordan River. Uh, Jesus' disciples are baptizing more people than you. And John the Baptist replied, uh, we are working together. We are having, we're having the same goal in mind. Do not bother them because we are working together. And it's the same of us today. Churches today worldwide depends on, all right, we've got false churches today and we've got true churches today. Uh, let me take an example quickly. I come from AIM Church in Suyong, uh, Suyongru. Uh, it's an English ministry. That is where we were before we came here. When I look at the doctrine we preach here, the doctrine they preach there, it's exactly the same. So we are working. Even though they are there and we are here, we are working together. And now you find the other churches that preaching a different Jesus us and them are not working together. They are working, they are workers of iniquity. But this is just an example I'm giving. Like John and Jesus, they worked together. And the same with us, many churches today, we work together. Even though they are there and we are here, we all work together. So we see in verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's interesting that we have no uh, birth record of Jesus in the book. Of Mark. Mark starts with this is the good news of Jesus Christ. And the good news we know is the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have no uh, birth narrative or infancy of Jesus in the book of Mark. And it's interesting, John, I'm oh, sorry, Mark introduces us Jesus as the Son of God in Mark 1. Verse 1. Mark basically starts the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So Mark did this to stress the importance of Jesus' unique relationship to the Father. So Mark is stressing this emphasis that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the one that came from heaven to earth. When we look at verses 2 and 3 of Mark, it says the following, As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths 
straight. So Mark is actually quoting two Old Testament passages here. And the first one is Malachi 3 verses 1. And it reads as follows. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So now we should remember that Malachi was written 400 years before uh, the New Testament, we received the New Testament. So, and the other one is Isaiah 40 verses 3, and it says the following, A voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now the prophet Isaiah prophesied 700 years before the New Testament. So he prophesied about this in Isaiah 40 verse 3, and this came to pass here in Mark 1. So 700 years before, Isaiah prophesied this, and here it is coming into fulfillment. This is why the Bible, there are so many prophecies in the Old Testament that was given about the life of Jesus that came true in the New Testament. This is why the Bible is such a remarkable book. It's unlike any other book that we have. So we see here that John the Baptist was divinely appointed by God to prepare the way for Jesus. This was John's mission. So we should remember in ancient times, back here in the first century and even before this, uh, when a king would go to a town or a new country, what he would do usually is he would send out his ambassadors or his heralds. A herald was someone proclaiming, Hey guys, look out, the king is on his way. So what would happen is the king would send out the ambassadors and the heralds to, to travel on the road, the king would travel, to see if the road is safe and the town where the king would live, if it is safe for the king, if he would go and live there and stay there for a while. So this was the job of ambassadors and heralds. And in the same way, John the Baptist is a herald and ambassador of Jesus. He's going before Jesus to prepare the way for Jesus. Now we see that in verses 4, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. And it's interesting when we look at this account and we find the other accounts of John the Baptist uh, in Matthew 3, 1 to 12, and Luke 3, 1 to 20. Uh, when we look at these accounts, we can easily say, but John was only baptizing people. He was a baptist. He, he baptizes people. This was his job. But First and foremost, John the Baptist was a preacher with an urgent message. Before he baptized the people, he was preaching. This was his job, this was his mission to prepare the people of the coming Messiah. So we see that uh, John's ministry was to call the nation of Israel to repentance in preparation of the coming Messiah. He began a preaching ministry in the desert of Judea. So it's the barren area between the Judean hills and the Dead Sea. So this is where John was operating. So when the crowds began to respond to his preachings, he withdrew to the east bank of the Jordan River where he baptized them. The core of John's message was that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. This is what he was telling the nation of Israel. Hey guys, the kingdom of God has arrived in the fallen world and we better watch out because he is here. He is on the way. So it meant the following. The Messiah was at hand. This is what he was telling the nation of Israel. 
So the unifying theme of John's preaching was the following. The arrival of Jesus would bring about God's judgment on the wicked and blessing on the righteous. This is why John was a preacher with an urgent message telling the nation of Israel, Hey guys, you need to repent. You need to turn back to God because when Jesus comes and you did not repent, you will bring judgment. This is, what, this is what John was preaching. And we will look later, we will see, even in the ministry of Jesus, Jesus' first sermon he ever preached was, he said the following, repent and believe for the kingdom of God is at hand. We all know Jesus is compassionate and is loving and is kind, but Jesus was a fiery fire. His first message was repent. And the same with John. John is telling them, guys, you need to repent because God's judgment is coming into this world. This was why John was a preacher with an urgent message. John said the following in Matthew 3, 7 and Luke 3, verse 7. He, he warned the nation of Israel of the coming wrath. He said the following, Every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. This was what John was preaching. He was saying the trees that are not bearing fruit, when Jesus comes, He's going to cut them down. He's going to throw them in fire. This was the message that John brought to them. He warned the crowds that every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. We have evidence of this in Matthew 3.10, uh, Luke 3 verse 9. We know in Revelation 1.7, uh, the day when Jesus comes back, it's going to be a terrifying day for many people. Uh, for believers, we are going to rejoice that day, but for the unbelievers, it is not going to be a very nice day for them. We find this in Revelation 1 verse 7, and it says the following, Behold, He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see Him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. And the word wail means cry. People will flee that day. The unrepentant people will flee the day when Jesus arrives. And we see the same that John tried to warn them, telling them, hey guys, the judgment of God is coming. You need to repent. So we need to remember in the context that, that John was right, that John the Baptist was preaching here. He said that Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. We should remember uh, with this saying that we also have the word fire. So, but this fire refers to the unquenchable fire of judgment. This does not refer to the ecstatic speaking in tongues here. This is not what it refers to. John was saying that when Jesus comes, and He baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. So, us as believers, when we receive Jesus, when we confess of our sins and repent and place our trust in Him, He gives us the Holy Spirit. But if we don't do that, He will baptize us with fire when you come back, meaning the judgment. This is basically what John the Baptist was telling them. If you do not accept Christ and the Christ is going to pay for your sins, you will come back and you will repent. You will receive the judgment of God. So this is what John was trying to say to them. So you say that when Christ came, He would baptize the righteous in the Holy Spirit, but He would baptize the unrepentant in the judgment of fire. So this was John's message to the nation of Israel. So John focused much on repentance as the kingdom of God was at hand. But as we know, people, we are very clever. People today are very smart, even back in the first century world. So while John was preaching this message, many people just came to John and said, Oh no, John, just baptize me. But John noticed, hey guys, you are getting baptized with the wrong motives here. And this is the following that John, John told the following to them in Matthew 3. Verse 7. So many people heard this message and they thought to themselves, Alright, 
I'm just going to get baptized. I don't need to live a life of true repentance. I'm just going to go through with this tradition and do this because maybe I'm just going to do this to please John. But John the Baptist saw what they were doing and he said the following in Matthew 3 verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So here we see the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to John. They told John, all right, we want to get baptized. But their lives uh, didn't show true repentance. So they were getting baptized for all the wrong reasons. Their hearts were not turned towards God. Uh, they didn't seek true repentance. They only wanted to do the baptism so that they maybe can please their own conscience or please John the Baptist. So John saw this, and this is basically what it means. There should always be a change of heart when we repent. True repentance is always a change of of heart, it's a change of attitude. Uh, just to say I'm sorry by doing the same thing a hundred times over, it's not true repentance. True repentance is always a change of attitude and a change of heart. So the baptism in itself does not produce repentance. Baptism is the result of repentance. So if I've truly repented in my heart and turn away from my sins and look unto the Lord Jesus for salvation, yeah, yes, then I can get baptized. Mm -hmm. So it's always the issue of the heart first. It's always an inward decision followed by an outward action. And this is what John was telling the nation of Israel. He's like, guys, your hearts are still in the wrong place. It's not in the right place. The judgment of Christ is coming. So baptism in itself did not produce forgiveness or grant access into the blessings of the coming kingdom. Real repentance leads to forgiveness. Baptism in the Spirit and the entrance in the kingdom. And the baptism in the Spirit basically means the following. When we confess and turn to Jesus, He baptizes us with His Holy Spirit. He's giving us this Holy Spirit. And as time goes on, our heart starts to change. Our mind starts to change. The things that we once did, we don't want to do those things anymore. And all believers, when you've confessed, you receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. Every believer has the Holy Spirit. There is no uh, external, uh, how do you say this, expectation to seek receiving the Holy Spirit. Scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 that all believers on the moment of confession, receives the Holy Spirit. We should remember that in the book of Acts, Acts is not normative to us today. It worked a little bit different. And we should remember Corinthians was written a while after, after the book of Acts. So this is what John was telling them here. And it's the same of us today. All of us have received the Holy Spirit the moment we placed our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And He changes us with time. Yes, there would still be things in our lives. We would still be struggling with sin. We would still, but we, we would always, uh, Romans says that this that I want to do, uh, I do not do. And that what I don't want to do, I do. So if, if you want to know if you are a true Christian today, if you struggle with this, uh, this that you want to do, you don't do, and vice versa, you are a true Christian today. Because if this didn't bother you, you wouldn't have worried. So if you want to know if you are a true Christian today, I, the, I think it's in Romans 7, I will just go and make sure. It says, Paul wrote there, and it said that this is what he wants to do, he doesn't do it. And this is what he doesn't want to do, he does this. That is a true Christian today. If you think about those things, you are a true Christian today. If you struggle with the the fight against the flesh and the spirit, you are a true Christian. And let me tell you, the fight, it's a daily fight. It's a daily 
thing for the Christian to fight against the flesh and to choose the spirit over the flesh. It is not easy, but it's doable with the help of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need to make a decision daily to, it's fight or die. And especially in this fight or die, the struggle with the flesh and the spirit. Now we see in verse 6 that John uh, was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And we see in 2 Kings 1 verse 8 it said the following about Elijah. He wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather around his waist and he said it is Elijah the Tishbite. You see they look exactly the same. That is why many people were saying, but this is Elijah. No, but it was John. So we see they looked exactly, they wore the same clothes and they operated in the same bow. And then in verse 7 and 8, um, John the Baptist said the following, and he preached saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So what's happening here in these last two verses, when we go to a restaurant uh, and I want to eat something, some people usually look, depends on what part of the world you are, they will start with a starter, it's a small light meal, and the, the full meal will be, of your main course will be a full meal. So what's happening here is John saw himself as the starter. Jesus was the main course. So Jesus, John was the one preparing the way to the main course. John was the best man, not the bridegroom. Uh, he was the servant, not the savior. So we see the life of John. He went to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. And what a great example for us today, uh, just like John the Baptist, to point others to Jesus and say, but I must become less and He must become more. I think if we take this whole account and we can sum it up in a few verses or a few sentences, I think this is the number one point standing out, that He must become more. I must become less. I need to carry my cross daily, point people to Him, because all glory and honor uh, belonged to, to Him. So, and also, I think that will be the first question for us today. Do we point people to Jesus? Uh, do I become less on a daily basis? Uh, does He become more? Uh, I think that's questions we can all uh, take home with us and, and examine our own hearts and see. But do I point people to Jesus? And uh, is He more? And am I less uh, in my life? And regardless of what you find, uh, God helps us with this. We can ask the Holy Spirit to examine our hearts and God can help us. If I sit on the throne too much, uh, I need to climb down. I need to climb down from the throne and say, Jesus, but I've been sitting here for too long. The throne belongs to you. Uh, I must become less. You must become more. And the same way, the second point I think is, uh, do our lives represent the fruit of repentance? Uh, when we go out there where we live, what we do, do I have this fruit? Because I can't do, I can't make this fruit on my own. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, let's examine to see the, the time. Are you still in the faith? Are you still running the race of faith? Or have you maybe stopped? Maybe you backslided a little. I don't know. This is why we need to examine our own hearts in this. Are you still in the faith? The same year with John telling them, you're only coming here to get baptized. Uh, I think for us today... To see, are we still in the faith? And that we, the day when we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, that we turn to Him for the right reasons. 
for, for the repentance of our sins and for the salvation of our souls and not for the wrong reasons. And I think it's all questions all of us can examine for ourselves. And this is remarkable, even though if we do mess up here and there, there's still forgiveness for that. This is why, why we still have today to examine our hearts, ask the Holy Spirit to help us with these things, to see what fruit am I producing in my life? Uh, how does my fruit look? Do I give bad fruits or do I give good fruits? Uh, is Jesus more and am I less? Let's take this example of John the Baptist and point people to Jesus, uh, becoming less uh, and making him he must become more, give all glory and honor and everything Amen. to Him. So let's take this today. Let's go home today and think about this. As this is the Word of God, this is not my own words. God has not let His words turn void back to Him. And ask the Holy Spirit to help us with this message today. Let's pray together. Um, Heavenly Father, we. We thank today, Lord, for this account that we have of, of John the Baptist as he, as he went out and he prepared the way for, for the coming King, for the Messiah. And we thank you, Lord, for, for the ministry of John the Baptist as we see that John's Baptist and Jesus' uh, ministry, they were intervened with each other, Lord. They worked uh, together, Lord. They were on the same team, Heavenly Father. And same today for us, Lord, as believers. We are in the same team as the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is our duty and our role to point people to Him. I, we also ask you today, Holy Spirit, that you will examine our hearts to see if we are less and He is more. Please help us with this, Holy Spirit, that, that we will live our life in the spirit that we will lay down our fleshly desires and ambitions and take up uh, the spirit we also ask you god that you will help us in, in the times of temptation and in the times of trials and sufferings that the things that we need to do what your word commands us that we will do those things lord and the things that we don't want to do that we won't do them heavenly father but with that god when we stumble and when we fail god that you will Help us with that, God. But we will come to your throne boldly and say, but God, I messed up. Uh, I need you to, to help me and pick me up and give me true repentance and true guidance in this. God, we, we can't do this on our own, Lord. You say in your word that through our weakness, you are strong. And this is where we want to live, Lord, is through this weakness so that you can become big, so that you can be strong and so that you can become more. Thank you, God, for this PICC family in this congregation, Lord. I pray that the word of Christ will dwell richly in their Amen. lives, Heavenly Father, and that they will apply this to our Amen. lives and myself as well, God. Thank Amen. you that you are good. Thank you for the forgiveness of our Amen. sins. Amen. Thank you that we know we will be with you Amen. one day. And we look, we look to the finish line, God, where you will be standing, Lord Jesus, where we will meet you face to face. Amen. One day, help us in everything that we do, that we will live like Romans 11 verse 36, that Amen. all we do, that we will bring glory and honor Amen. to you and enjoy you Amen. forever. Amen. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, now receive this benediction. Uh, may you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and the day of eternity. Amen.